Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. And finally, we're moving into the 21st century of my Los Angeles reading list with Vanessa Place's La Medusa, or L.A. Medusa, or L.A. Med USA. Med possibly being the Swedish conjunction. I, I don't know exactly what to do with that, but, uh, or Medius, it's in the middle. Basically, I'm just toying around with the title. Look at that cover, by the way. And you see the symmetry, the two lobes, if you will. It's funny, the title came to me in the doctor's office. I took this in with me the other day, and the PA was like, oh, what's that book? That looks interesting. Uh, and I started to explain it to her, and I think I said something like, yeah, it is interesting. It's sort of trying to map a collective consciousness of the city of Los Angeles using the concept of Medusa. And as I was talking about it, I said, and you know, it's called La Medusa. It's constructed by and through and really for a feminist lens. So it's almost like the law reiterates or reinforces the feminine article. And then I thought, oh, actually, it could also be L.A. Medusa. And the thought came to me right there in the doctor's office. And then the more I played around with it, you know, I'm thinking of La La Land and all these types of things. Um, one of the best features of this novel is Vanessa Place's relentless, exuberant, extraordinary command of language. And really, language is. This has Latin, German, French, Greek... English, of course, Spanish, and it's all intertwined. The story of Medusa is serialized throughout this text that's sort of a roving and free-range stream of consciousness that's focalized through different characters. You've got a truck driver going from uh, Durham, North Carolina, of all places, which is 45 minutes from where I am right now, across the country to Needles, uh, California. You've got it focalizing through a young girl named Fina, focalizing through uh, other female lenses with Catherine, with Mrs. Bowles, who uh, appears to be the mother of Dr. Casper Bowles, who is a neurosurgeon. And we get a lot of his story, a lot of focalization with uh, Casper. We get two characters whom we've seen these different threads focalized to these characters, and then finally they start to converge, and that's sort of the moment we've all been waiting for. But besides that, the way that it's structured is incredible, because in attempting to make the city of Los Angeles a conscious being, what Vanessa Place has done is she has architected this through the schematic of the human brain, and in fact, the chapters, I guess we can call them, or episodes to, to go with uh, Joyce's Ulysses, which this is in the tradition of, they're divided by these sketches and photos of the real human brain. The pineal gland, the hippocampus, the periaqueductal gray, the cerebellum, the amygdala, medulla, thalamus, cingulate sulcus, vernix, and Broca's areas. Prefrontal cortex and superior frontal gyrus, the midbrain, the occipital and temporal lobes, and then the noumenon. And so the noumenon, when we get there, this is essentially where we end this book. I mean, it, it's a stunning read. It's a maximalist novel. It's a big book. It's multi-layered, densely packed. It's asking the huge questions and the small questions. It's a novel of ideas. It carries on in, in Joycey and Reverie with neologisms. Um, but the ending, which comes after a part that says, tear at perforation, which mirrors the beginning, which says, cut here, almost like the intro and the outro are things to be severed and cut away from the meat of the story. And this mirroring and symmetry is very important, just as the brain ha you know, has a physically and visually very uh, symmetrical and mirrored look. Medusa plays on mirrors. Of course, we all know if, if, uh, if Medusa looks in the mirror, she will turn to stone because her gaze turns uh, people to stone. And so Perseus uses her reflection 
to in in the shield that he takes with him reflects back at Medusa and turns her to stone and then lops her head off. You don't need to even be familiar with the story of Medusa to get the book because we're given it serialized throughout. And it goes even beyond to where it's almost like a, an early black and white TV series with a laugh track in the background with these funny jokes and domestic moments between Perseus and Medusa. And in fact, the, some of the very first lines we get in our intro says, Dr. Casper Bull's eyes his mirrored visor. Fina checks her pink Barbie mirror. And on and on and on. The opening episode has Miles P, the truck driver, going into an AMPM store and going down aisle three. And the closing episode will have the exact same thing. And I almost missed it, but something about that AMPM stuck in my memory. And I was able to go back and see that it was indeed a mirror image. And we'll get the literary device or the rhetorical device of what's called a chiasmus. A chiasmus is a two-part sentence uh, or structure where the parts mirror each other. When we get to the section with the cingulate sulcus, the very first sentence or two sentences open with, Dr. Casper Bowles is quite drunk. Quite drunk is Dr. Casper Bowles. So more than just more uh, lingual playfulness, that's a chiasmus where those two sentences mirror each other. So one of the things that's really interesting to do with this book is to question why divide the book in this way? We know that she's got this idea of constructing a, a, a sentient being or a consciousness out of LA, but why structure it and try to map it? Is it even mapped sort of schematically to the human brain? Furthermore, what's the significance of the order in which we're given these segments of the brain? We get great glimpses of L.A. and L.A. culture, such as the 405 is always congested. Always. Honestly, you could shoot a cannon down the left lane at aught three on any Wednesday and you'd slaughter a small town's worth of just folk. God knows what they're doing there at that hour, but they're doing it at well over 75 miles per hour. I found that to be quite true. Andre Belli said there are intentional and unintentional cities. Or maybe that was Dostoevsky again. The city started intentionally and then became un. So many of our visitors feel betrayed, for people believe beautiful weather should mean something. Los Angeles was a mission until 1822 when it was annexed by Mexico, described by Richard Henry Dana as remote, almost desert, a place where there is neither law nor gospel. Joan Didion noted, the city burning is Los Angeles's deepest image of itself. And that harkens back, of course, to Nathaniel West in The Day of the Locust. It's a polyphonic novel, a cacophonous novel. There are all these different voices and the narrator is in there too. And sometimes it shifts even in mid-sentence, kind of like what we see in You Bright and Risen Angels by William T. Volman. It's very exciting, this fluidity that we get to experience with these focalization points. All of these different things are combined together to construct what's known as the autobiographical self. We also are trying to get to the feeling of what it's like, or the feeling of feeling mapped through this biochemistry and electric pulses of the brain, but also these different sort of uh, biographical psychosomatic constructs of different identities. So we're getting the voice of a young child. We're getting the voice of an old woman. We're getting the voice of her caretaker. We're getting the voice of the neurosurgeon. Uh, we're also getting the voice even of a John Doe that is a corpse there in the morgue. There are all these different forms too. It can take on the, the form of uh, a play. It can take on the form of almost like notes, directorial notes for, for a movie, you know, telling it to get a tight shot here, pan out here, uh, cut, close on this shot, things like that. It's got a lot of humor and the writing is beautiful. I mean, it is beautiful. There are portions of it that read like poetry, prose poetry. It is extremely obvious to anyone who reads this that Vanessa Place is a true artist, the true poet artist, as well as a, an extremely observant and intelligent person. 
Uh, she has an ear for all kinds of different accents and jargon, and it comes in here. Uh, she also happens to be a lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer at that. Or I don't know if she still is, but she was for a time. Here she is, by the way. And Vanessa, if you watch this or if anybody knows, were you deliberately channeling that uh, sort of iconic picture of Susan Sontag in this photo? Listen to this blurb that Michael Silverblatt gave the book. La Medusa returns to James Joyce's Ulysses to find the inspiration for an investigation into the nature of experience. Los Angeles takes the role of Dublin. The brain and its double cortex generate the stylistic intricacies that the organs and senses do in Joyce. And this is above all a female epic in which the swirling city universe is explored and shaped by the petrifying eye and intellect of the wily Medusa her coiling locks extending everywhere. It's beautiful blurb and, and sums up sort of that structure and style. There is a portion of the text round about page 300 that all of a sudden becomes Finnegan's Wakeian. And it is focalized through a patient with aphasia. And so we'll get these things where it says something like, agreeing, taste the tip, naked juice, armor conquers awe. And the way that it's written, armor concours awe, this is sort of a, a really Joycean neologism where we, in English, we hear love conquers all, but at the same time, we see love conquers awe. And even concours is hinting at that French verb, kind of like uh, Joyce's neologism, pas encore. But it wouldn't even really do me, do it any justice to read this section. Um, I thought I would, but really you need to see it. Because when you read it, it phonetically has one meaning, but when you see it written on the page and how it's constructed of parts of various languages, you see how it's also hinting at several other meanings at the same time. As this city sprang from the desert, you lovingly lie in the spume on a floor, simple and thick as a tongue. Seed splayed around your head, seeping to balls that ripen and rot, balls that grow longer and larger and new men and women will form from these contortions. Men and women alike come screaming and bare licked into being, their hands and feet bleeding with red clay, crept to life on credit and ash. And that sort of uh, invokes the image of Perseus when he's riding Pegasus, I think, and he has the head of Medusa, droplets of blood are falling on the ground and creatures are spawning from those droplets. So I presume that's what we're getting at with these balls that are springing uh, new beings to life. But Perseus had been well warned and kept his eyes on the shield he held below his chin. He could just make out the gruesome face in the silver bubble, the jutting eggs of its eyes pitted black as olives the rough cast and crack of its neck, where the shoots lay thick as chalk, the face's roiling contours, snakes creeling like eels in a horse's severed head. But he could see clear enough to strike, and as Perseus raised his golden sickle to deliver the death blow to the gorgon, Medusa looked at her assassin's shining armor, and for the first time in her life, she saw what she looked like. Her scream of joy was cut off. And then when we go to the next episode, immediately after that, we get this great uh, parallel or, or, or uh, echoing transition. Adelie rips the head of the Romaine in half. A dinner party as an exercise in logistics. And this is, it's just great writing. I hope you're hearing it. I hope it's coming through. There's tons of internal rhyming within all these things. There's riddles thrown in, children's nursery rhymes. Everything's bent just a little bit through that funhouse mirror of Vanessa Place's mind. The only way I can think to even sum up this little surface scratching about La Medusa or L.A. Medusa is to say that it reads as if it's a found document written in the language of Los Angeles, and we're reading an English translation. 